You know, every generation has its where were you when moments. About, usually about some major cultural event or something that's happened. You know, like the where were you when Neil Armstrong landed on the moon or where were you when you heard that JFK or Martin Luther King Jr. had been shot? Where were you when you heard about Columbine or where were you on 9-11? Uh, some of those examples might be before some of our times. But now we all have a new one that we can ask in the future. Where were you when you realized that this coronavirus thing was for real? Right? That's going to be a thing in the future, I think. You know, this year has had more uncertainty than probably any other year in most of our lifetimes. We all know what the headlines have been over the last uh, few months. Global pandemic economic recession, mass unemployment, political division, cultural upheaval, racial tension, record wildfires, including fire tornadoes. That's happening. That's happened out in California. You can Google that. It's pretty wild to see. Extra powerful hurricanes. You know, Louisiana's been hit and the Caribbean. And floods all over. Have I missed anything? And apparently, we've added a new word to our cultural vocabulary this year to describe how we all engage all this chaos on social media. Maybe you've heard the word. It's called doom scrolling. Anybody heard of doom scrolling or doom surfing? It's the act of consuming an endless procession of negative online news to the detriment of the scroller's mental wellness. This is actually a thing, like a real thing. So hopefully we're all learning that we need to limit our doom scrolling, especially before bedtime, because it's enough to give anyone major anxiety issues if you don't have them already. If there's ever been a year when we need the hope of Christmas, I'd say this is that year, right? I'd even like to suggest that even with all of the craziness of this year, we've actually been given a gift for this special season. It's the opportunity to rediscover Christmas. So for the next four weeks, we're going to be exploring themes that are found in the Christmas story of the birth of Christ. Those themes are hope and peace and joy and love. And on Christmas Eve, our Advent experience will climax as we celebrate the birth of Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah, and how he came into the world as one of us. So as we explore these themes of Advent, we're going to look at how they show up in the lives of different characters that are in this Christmas story. But first, let's cover a little background of the times in which these people were living. You know, we think we have it bad today, but so did Israel back in the Bible days, and they could make a pretty good case during the time of Jesus when they were pretty much living like the rest of the world was, as a defeated nation under the rule of this mighty Roman Empire that had conquered just about the whole world. And they were all about conquest. They were all about brutality and continuing to expand their empire. So this was a tough day to live in. It wasn't easy. And in this time when the Romans were ruling Israel, it had been thousands of years since Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and that original establishment of God's people. It had been a long time. And during those thousands of years, that included being invaded by various countries and enemies like the Assyrians and the Babylonians and then the massive empires of the Greeks and the Romans. It had been so many generations since the formation of God's covenant with humanity where he promised to send a Messiah, where he promised to make things right and that he would restore all that we humans had messed up after he created this perfect world. And, and this fulfillment of, of this uh, this covenant that God had made and this, the coming of this Messiah 
who would make everything right. This wasn't just some happy idea that, that drifted in and out of their minds and in their culture in that time. This was the foundation. This was what their deepest hope was. It sustained them and it encouraged them and it motivated them to keep their faith, especially through thousands of years of waiting. Can you imagine? They clung to God's promise that he made to Abraham. In Genesis 12, 3, he simply said, all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Through you. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you. And Israel stood on that covenant and that promise. But they often wondered, how long are we going to have to wait for this Messiah? How long till things are made right? How long could hope survive, especially under the rule of the Greeks and the Romans, whose culture was so powerful that it's still influencing us even right now today? But as we'll see in Luke's account of the Christmas story, traces of hope remained throughout those thousands of years, even into the time when Jesus was born. And so today we're going to pick up Luke's story in a really unusual place when we're talking about the Christmas story. I mean, most of the time, you know what the Christmas story is about. We got Mary and Joseph, and we got Jesus in the manger, and then we have the shepherds visiting, and then going back to their their, their flocks of, of sheep at, at night, as the song says. And we even uh, sneak in the Magi, right? We, we kind of put them in the story in the nativity because it's kind of convenient to get everybody there, get them in the group photo, and get them in the, the nativity sets that we like, right? Even though they weren't, they weren't really there until much later. But we, we put all that together in the Christmas story. And so, yes, Luke's Christmas story... Uh, his account does technically end uh, the night of Jesus' birth. But the next scene in Luke's story is important too. I'd like for us to just look a little more closely today at the lesser known part of the story and specifically at its two main characters outside of Jesus and his parents. People, uh, a, a man named Simeon and a woman named Anna. So let's, let's read Luke's account. Uh, right after Jesus had been born. Luke 2, 22. Luke says, Then it was time for their purification offering, as required by the law of Moses, after the birth of a child. So his parents, that's Mary and Joseph, took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. The law of the Lord says, If a woman's first child is a boy, he must be dedicated to the Lord. So they offered the sacrifice required in the law of the Lord, either a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. At that time, there was a man in Jerusalem named Simeon. He was righteous and devout and was eagerly waiting for the Messiah to come and rescue Israel. The Holy Spirit was upon him, and he had revealed to him that he would not die until he had seen the Lord's Messiah. That day, the Spirit led him to the temple. So when Mary and Joseph came to present the baby Jesus to the Lord as the law required, Simeon was there. He took the child in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, now let your servant die in peace as you have promised. I have seen your salvation, which you have prepared for all people. He is a light to reveal God to the nations, and he is the glory of your people, Israel. Jesus' parents were amazed at what was being said about him. Then Simeon blessed them, and he said to Mary, the baby's mother, This child is destined to cause many in Israel to fall. And many others to rise. He has been sent as a sign from God, but many will oppose him. As a result, the deepest thoughts of many hearts will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your very soul. Kind of heavy words from Simeon. Verse 36 Anna, a prophet, was also there in the temple. She was the daughter of Phanuel from the tribes of Asher, and she was very old. Her husband died when they had been married only seven years. Then she lived as a widow to the age of 84. She never left the temple, but stayed there day and night, worshiping God with fasting and prayer. She came along just as Simeon was talking with Mary and Joseph, and she began praising God. She talked about the child to everyone who had been waiting expectantly for God to rescue Jerusalem. So we see that Simeon and Anna... They were like two sparks in Israel, sparks of hope. 
for Israel because they were expecting God to come through and to do what he said he was going to do. Even, even after all those years, they were still waiting expectantly. They'd gotten old, they'd seen and they'd experienced a lot of things, both in their own lives, both hardship for Israel and pain in their own lives. I mean, we know that for decades, Anna was a widow, which in that day was a, was a position of really low social status in that culture. But we also know that Simeon and Anna remained faithfully devoted to God. And they were expecting God to do great things. They never lost hope. Did you notice in the passage that neither Simeon nor Anna, they, they didn't really seem surprised um, or uncertain about the fact that this baby, this Jesus, that he is the long-awaited Messiah. They, they didn't even seem to bat an eyelash. Like they, it just, they just knew. Now, almost everyone in the Christmas story, if you've read it before or you've heard it, up to this point, it's a little different. They've needed some convincing about the whole situation and what's happening. If you think about, you know, the angels that appeared to Joseph and to Mary. They come with this heavenly announcement, and a lot of times the people are caught off guard, and some of them are terrified. Maybe God just knew that considering uh, Simeon and Anna may, being older, maybe he just knew that if an angel appeared, they might have a heart attack, and he didn't want that. So he just chose to do it a little, a little differently. Or maybe God didn't need to. Maybe God didn't need to send him an angel because they had such strong faith. They were ready for what God was going to do. They were tuned in. They were waiting and watching and listening and expecting. In other words, they were filled with hope in a dark time. Day after day, year after year, Simeon and Anna were fueled by the hope that God was at work, even though they couldn't see it and they didn't understand it. Even if they were surrounded by hardship, God was still going to work. They believed that. How did they do that? How did they hold on for so long to that hope? Well, they put their ultimate hope in the Lord that they worshiped him, they continued to serve him, that they were faithful in just taking one step at a time. And they waited. Does anybody else hate waiting? Yeah. It's hard to wait. I can't imagine that they held on to this their entire lives into their older years, that they believed they were going to see the Messiah every day. It's incredible. And so they saw this baby, this Jesus, the Messiah, the Savior of the world, and their faith caused them to celebrate because they knew, they knew it's him. And, and this, this faith and this hope, this inspired other people, like Mary and Joseph, who were there trying to figure out how in the world are we going to be a parent to the Son of God himself. Just being a parent of a regular kid is hard enough, right, parents? Can you imagine the creator of all things being in a human form and you're his mom and dad? Man, I, I wish we had more to those early years, more of the story of how Jesus was. And so I'm sure they were overwhelmed and just seeing Simeon and Anna be excited and declare that this is the Christ filled them with hope. And so these two pillars of the faith, Simeon and Anna, they reveal several things about the power of hope that we can take and we can apply in our lives. Just want to share these three things with you. The first one is that hope sees beyond the now. Hope sees beyond the now. You could say that hope is the fuel of faith. The fuel of dreams, the, the, the fuel of possibilities. It's, it's like hope is that whisper that just says, maybe, maybe. Like, yeah, it doesn't look like it, but maybe, maybe it is. 
And maybe you're here and your year hasn't been that bad. Maybe the, the virus or all the stuff going on hasn't affected you or your family too much. And that's great. Praise the Lord. But for, for many others, your year has been painful or disappointing and just terrible. But no, ba- no matter how bad your 2020 has been, no matter what kind of problems and struggles that you're facing right now, let me encourage you to not give up hope. Do not give up hope. Because hope can live through even what seemingly is totally hopeless circumstances. And I'm not just talking about some kind of generic hope, just general hope, or hope in some person or even in some ideal. I'm saying that hope is alive because God is alive and God is with us. And His Holy Spirit helps us to live this out. The Apostle Paul talks about this in Romans 8 when he emphasizes the importance of waiting and hoping in the Lord from Romans 8, 24. He says, we were given this hope when we were saved. He's he's speaking about the hope of eternal life with Christ. And then he says, if we already have something, we don't need to hope for it. But if we look forward to something we don't yet have, we must wait patiently and confidently And the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. In other words, hope exists before reality comes to pass. For example, you can hope with all your heart that I have a Walmart gift card in my pocket. You can hope that. You can hope that I might take it out and give it to you right here, right now, today. You can think about it. You can expect it. You can believe it. You can tell yourself to to just believe that it's going to happen. You can hope that you'll walk out of here a little richer today. Does anyone have hope that I have a gift card in my pocket? Does anyone have hope here today? There's one. There's two. Anybody else have hope that I have one? Yeah, kind of. (laughs) Yeah. Maybe I do. Maybe I don't. I didn't say that I did. It's not confirmed, but I did plant that seed, didn't I? So now you're kind of wondering, maybe. Maybe he does. Well, maybe I do. Who was it over here? Was it? Huh? (laughs) I think it was Aaron, right? That's Levi. Levi, come on up here for a second. You were waffling. You were kind of like, yeah, maybe he does. Just stand right here for a second. So, let's face them. There we go. So, if, if I, I didn't tell you that I had a gift card, right? But I mentioned it, so you thought, maybe he does. Yeah. So, what if I told you I have one in my pocket? Would you believe me? Now, you're, you're totally sure, right? You have faith and hope. Well, I do actually have one. So, there you go. Yeah. Thanks, man. High five. $25 right to you. That's right. <laughs> yeah, I have 17 more. and re- No. No, but see, what happened right there is that he had hope, and then I told him that I had one, and he believed me, and his certainty grew, and then he received it. Our hope is in the Lord and in the promises of the Lord. We don't have just empty hope or just like, well, I, maybe it will. We have the promises of God. God has already told us what will be. The ultimate hope is in Christ, and it's a done deal. It's a certain thing. So we don't lose hope because of our circumstances or because we're in a down economy or because things aren't going our way all the time or because the election didn't go the way that we wanted it to or because we had some sickness hit. We know that we know the certainty and the promises of God. And he's a good father who gives gifts to his children just like Levi got. Enjoy it, buddy. <laughs> so now that, that the gift card has been given, you can accept it as reality and hope is no longer needed. You're not hoping anymore. It's done. It's over. See, by its very nature, hope exists in uncertainty. It exists in uncertainty. That's the very, very nature of hope. 
It exists in the questions and in the doubts and in the unclear sense of what is to come. But hope is the willingness to believe beyond what our present reality is showing to us. See, we have hope just by the nature of saying that. We also are admitting that we have uncertainty. Because hope only exists in uncertainty. And so, I want to be a person of hope because I just know that God's going to come through. That God's got this. So hope sees beyond the now. The second thing is that hope reminds us that God is still with us. Hope reminds us of that, that God is still with us, that both now and in the future, He is with us. Look at the beginning of verse 26. And the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. He is here now. He is present. He's engaged with us. You see, with God, there is no uncertainty. God never hopes for anything. He's certain about everything. And He knows your struggles. He wasn't taken by surprise when the virus went global. He wasn't surprised when the economy tanked. Or when you or your loved one received that bad diagnosis or that call in the middle of the night that put you in crisis mode. He wasn't scrambling trying to figure it out. He sees you. He's here. Whether you are on top of the world or whether you're in a mess, whether you're alone or whether you're surrounded by people, whether your relationships are broken or they're whole, he's here and he's engaged and he's ready. He's ready. He's Emmanuel, the scripture calls him, which means God with us. And this hope that he brought into the world so long ago is the same hope that he offers right now, today. It isn't just something that he dangles before us, always just keeping it just out of reach. It's also not something that we have to try to fake or manufacture or work up just so we can get by. No, this, this hope that God has, he installs it within us as we follow him and as we surrender our lives to him. This hope is fueled by the Holy Spirit. Even in our weakness, even we don't, when we don't have what it takes. You know, I feel that a lot in my, my life and in my work and ministry and all that. I feel like I don't, I don't have what it takes. And I go to the Lord and say, God, you got to fill all the gaps you got to fill in all the cracks and you got to say what you want to say and do what you want to do and just use this broken vessel. I feel that, that the Holy Spirit is present right now to help us in our weakness and to cover us. Even when we don't see how things are going to work out, even when we feel so limited, the Holy Spirit is there to remind us of God's faithfulness. He's with us every step of the way. Hope reminds us that God is still with us. And then third is that hope inspires us to move forward. Even when we're not sure where we're going or where we'll end up. Man, have you ever taken one of those steps where you have hope and so it's pushing you forward and you say, yeah, but I don't know where this is leading and I don't know where I'm going to end up, but the Lord is nudging me and I'm going to take that step. Because we trust in a God that has a plan, and then he has a purpose for all things, including us, including each one of our individual lives. We have to keep following the leading of the Lord in whatever season we're in. He still speaks in times of blessing and abundance, in times where you feel like you're in a desert. God's still there working, and he still speaks. So there's this this cycle of hope that, that Christ followers can experience. I want to read this from Romans 5. And see if you see this in your own life. If not, this may be a goal to to try to get into this flow of this cycle. In Romans 5, 2, Paul says, Because of our faith, Christ has brought us into this place of undeserved privilege. That's the truth. Where we now stand and we confidently and joyfully look forward to sharing God's glory. Don't we? We confidently and joyfully, we look forward to what God has. We look forward to eternity. And then in verse 3, we can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials. Wait a minute, Paul. We can rejoice 
when we run into problems and trials, for we know that they help us develop endurance. Okay, so, yeah, yay, right? So problems, trials, they're good. Rejoice. Let's clap. Yay, we all go through hard times. Because why? It's developing something strong, an endurance to last, like Simeon and Anna, to not give up, to, to not be overwhelmed with the waiting, but to be okay, to be patient. Endurance, verse 4, and endurance develops strength of character. You want to be a person of character? Go through hard times. Wait on the Lord. Trust Him when you can't see what's around you. Endurance develops strength of character. And then character strengthens our confident hope of salvation. And we're kind of back where we started. We have joy. We have hope of salvation. And then he says, and this hope will not lead to disappointment. For we know how dearly God loves us because he has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love. In other words, this hope from the Holy Spirit doesn't let us down. It doesn't disappoint us. Instead, it gives us the ability to keep moving forward one step at a time, even when it's hard and we're not sure about things. There's this great story that's taken place during this pandemic, and it's about a, a man named Tom Moore, or Captain Tom, as he's often called. You may have heard about it in the news. I don't know how popular it was, but in all the doom and gloom of this pandemic, Captain Tom rose as this unlikely hero. So now he's called Captain Sir Tom Moore, since he was officially knighted by the Queen of England, and he is 100 years old. And he's from England, and uh, he decided to raise money for charity by walking 100 laps around his garden, uh, one, for each, one lap for each one of his years that he's been alive. This was back in April, right in the, in the middle of this pandemic. And so he was hoping to raise a little bit of money for this hospital charity, and this idea went viral when Tom, Tom's daughter, she posted it online on this online charity site. And so the news spread quickly and suddenly this World War II veteran who's he's leaning on his walker and he's wearing this navy blue blazer with all his, his military medals. He's walking around his garden. He became this inspiration all around the world. And people started to donate to his cause. Next thing you know, a lot of money was donated. Believe it or not, just from his own little walking a hundred times around his garden for this charity, he raised 33 million pounds, which is $44 million. I know, right? Yeah, Tom, Captain Tom, a hundred-year-old man decided to make a difference. He wanted a better future. And he raised $44 million. And now he says that he wants to travel the world once this pandemic subsides, subsides, and I think he totally should. <laughs> and I hope that I'm like that when I'm 100 years old. Probably should say, if I get to be 100 years old. But li listen to what Captain Tom told reporters. The first step was the hardest. After that, I got into the swing of it and kept on going. The first step was the hardest. Isn't that true of so many things in life? If you've ever tried dieting or working out, right, you know that it's the first day that's hard. Isn't that true of hope? It can, it can feel really hard to take that first step towards having faith in a better future, because that's really what hope is. Hope is faith in a better future, and sometimes it's just hard to take that first step of belief, okay, yes, I'm going there, I'm having hope, that there is a bright future. It's hard when we're discouraged or we're weighted down by our burdens, or we're frustrated with the way things are going. But when we receive the promise of hope in God's word through his Holy Spirit, we find new strength, we find inspiration to believe that there is a better day. When we focus on the birth and on the life and, and on the death and the resurrection and on the return of Jesus where he's going to reign for all eternity. Man, 
we find new strength to take that first step and then to keep moving one step at a time. So what's your next step today? What's your next step of hope in this Advent season? So often, I know we want to know what's going to happen tomorrow. We want to know the future, right? We're just, we want to know. We want to skip to the end of the story. How is all this going to turn out? But life just doesn't work that way. At least I've never had it work that way. But in Christ, we've already been told the ultimate end of the story. That we have victory through Jesus and that we can live a life that goes beyond all the brokenness of our world, both globally or nationally or even personally, that there is a different way to live, a different way to be. So in this Advent season, we can draw hope from God's faithfulness, His his long-awaited promise of this Messiah. We can focus on the hope of God's continued work, that He's not done Now, one day, we won't even need hope anymore because we'll experience the fullness of God's glory. Won't that be the day where our hope will become a reality? In the midst of all of this stuff going on, whatever life is throwing at you, you can experience the Holy Spirit living in you and carrying you and giving you strength to move forward. So we can live with great expectation because Christ came 2,000 years ago, and he's here with us right now. He's right here in this room, wherever you're joining us from. He's with you right now, and he's coming again one day in power and in victory to rule and reign over all things, and that is the hope of a believer. So I'd like to close today with a prayer that Paul prayed. Close a little different today. So can we stand together? I want to pray this over all of us. And you can put it on the screen too. This is the prayer that Paul prayed for the church. I pray that God, the source of hope, will fill you completely with joy and peace because you trust in Him. Then you will overflow with confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now, as we enter this season, let's not be afraid. Let's not be discouraged because we trust in the Lord who has all things in his hands. Let's not turn inward and become all about ourselves. Let's be reminded of this season that this is a season of giving and of loving and of sharing, of reaching out. So if you've got someone in your life who's suffering or hurting or who's alone, this is a great time to reach out with the hope of Christ. May the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face shine on you, be gracious to you and give you peace. And may you be a light in the darkness. Amen, amen. Thank you.